let's let's be honest residency is a tough time in life there there's not a lot of guidance out there how do you how do you become an upper year resident how when you're looking for a job what do you do how do you handle your personal finances these are all things that i sort of had to try and teach myself i wish there were resources out there so everybody listening to this you are in luck this episode of the curbsiders is sponsored by the american college of physicians with support from its council of resident and fellow members Beginning in July 2019, the ACP will offer exclusive content to its resident and fellow members that covers both personal and professional topics on stuff that is really important, like work-life integration, how to navigate career transitions, personal finances, and more. I'm sure that most of you, if you're like me, are not getting a ton of teaching on that right now, and this is this is designed to fill that gap. Through part of this is through a partnership with the Curbsiders, where we'll, we will be making episodes talking about how you transition from PGY1 to PGY2. How do you lead a team on the wards? What do you do when you go from PGY2 to PGY3 where you're on your way to being an attending? And finally, how do you transition from PGY3 to early career? How do you find a job? How do you settle into that job? We'll be making content on all of this. The additional resources on the ACP site will be self-paced learning modules, handouts, guides, worksheets, and ways to enhance your CV by participating in activities within your local chapter. So let ACP help you get through training, pass the boards, and transition into practice and beyond. If you're not yet a member, it's just $119 annually for residents. You can visit acponline.org forward slash resident to learn more about the benefits of resident and fellow membership and join our proud internal medicine community. The Curbside Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if you're wrong. You should always do your own homework and let us know the work. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Uh, you're you're coming into some really weird energy here, which I feel like is a great well, place hello, for Matt. the intro. Uh, of that, that of course means that Stuart Brigham is here. Hi, Stuart. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> now you're shy. Okay. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, with us all, as always, is the great Paul Williams. Hey, Matt. How are you? Good. And, and before you tell the audience what this is about and maybe berate them a little bit, Paul, uh, I also wanted to introduce the wonder, the wonderful Dr. Shreya Trivedi. Hi, Shreya. Thank you for coming back. How are you? Thanks uh, for putting up with us. I'm doing really well. It's the dream. It's a dream, guys. <laughs> I'm Wait, us. I mean me. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this episode. But in case people don't know what uh, what we do on this show, Paul, why don't you uh, set them straight? Oh, happy to, Matt. As always, we are the internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And then we also screw around up front a little bit to get to know our guests and sort of talk about work life integration. So if there is no joy in your heart, feel free to skip past that part and get to the actual interview proper. Do you actually think about what to say before you say it? No, it just kind of falls out of my brain. <laughs> out of your brain hole, Paul. Yes, sorry, forgive me. <laughs> I forgot to stay on brand. <laughs> Shreya, uh, why don't you add some substance to the show and tell people what <laughs> we're going to talk about? This is going to be a great episode. We're going to go through some really strong uh, theoretical as well as practical tips uh, going through how to set expectations with your team, how to lead your team, um, how to um, give feedback to your interns, as well as how to um, go about studying and reading as a resident. I, I think that I would have loved to have this episode available to me uh, going through residency. Uh, as I'll talk about on the show, this would have relieved me of a lot of guilt and a lot of mistakes. Uh, so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so our guest on this episode is Dr. Abby Spencer, MD, MS, FACP. She is the director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program and vice chair for education for the medical... Uh, for the Medicine Institute at Cleveland Clinic. In this role, she oversees curriculum development, program innovation, teaching, mentoring, cultivating her leadership team, and faculty development. Dr. Spencer is part of the core curriculum team of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Excellence in Coaching and Mentoring, 
or CECM, and she teaches advanced peer coach training courses. She delivers multiple faculty development, educational courses, and workshops nationally, regionally, and locally for medical educators. She has won numerous national awards and recognition for her teaching, educational scholarship, mentorship, and leadership. Her residency program leadership team was recently the recipient of both an AIM Innovation Grant as well as an ACGME Back to the Bedside Innovations Grant. She has participated in leadership positions on multiple national committees and organizations. She proudly led the first ever all-women IM chief resident team this academic year. In her free time, she loves to spend time with her family outdoors, at the theater, and cheering on the Steelers, Pens, or Pitt Panthers. Um, I was going to make a Penn State comment, but I will I will let that go. And, <laughs> <laughs> so without Wise. further delay... Uh, Here is our discussion with the wonderful Dr. Abby Spencer. All right, Abby, we have been waiting so long to talk to you, and we're so happy for you to join us tonight. So let's get started. Can you give the audience a one-liner about yourself? Sure. Well, thank you. I'm also very excited to be here. Uh, I would describe myself, I guess, as an enthusiastic educator, driven by teaching, mentoring, and coaching others to be their best and to really find and live their why. I married my best friend and anatomy lab partner from med school, and we have two spirited boys that keep us humble and busy. Abby, what would you say is your favorite failure, um, and what did you learn from it? So uh, I have the the good or bad fortune to have, have many failures, uh, many that rise to the top, but um, probably one of the most meaningful would be as a as an intern uh, when I when I cried with a with a family about a patient, and it first felt embarrassed and and like a complete failure that I had let my emotions take over. And in debriefing later with one of the oncology fellows, I still remember her name actually was Abby, also, um, who told me as she got a little bit teary that she wishes she could still cry with patients and families and to never lose that. And so I thought that was something that at the time felt like a big failure and grew into one of my, I think and hope greatest strengths of just empathy and connection and how much I care about people and relationships and that um, seeing crying as a, as a way that we emote and that emotion is real and, and we should have it so that we can connect with our patients and our learners in real ways. I love that. I think it's been it's been a while since I've cried with a patient and I've kind of thought the same thing is that have I just seen so much pathology that I'm not uh, or I'm just in the hustle and bustle of things that I, I can't I don't give myself the time and space to cry to feel emotions. And so I think that's really powerful what the fellow uh, told you about don't don't lose this ability. Normally, I just start crying and they cry with me. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So, uh, Abby, what book are you reading right now? I am reading, I just started it by Brene Brown. Um, what is it called? Brave, Brave Enough to Lead? Leading Bravely. Leading Bravely. Is it good? I love it. I love it. I actually already wrote down quotes from it that I want to find a way to say tonight, if, if even possible. <laughs> um, nice. I love all of her books and, and the quote sort of, I live by life by quotes from either books, 80s movies, or my children. And th- she's, she just gives me so much fodder to understand the world. It's called Leading Bravely? Correct. I know she has a bunch of TED Talks. And is bravery her thing? Or does she, does she also do a talk about shame as well? Is that, yeah, so is that her? Exactly. She's a shame and a vulnerability researcher. And her original career was in organizational development. And then she, as she started researching connection, she started learning more about shame and vulnerability and disconnection. And so her first few books were all about that. And then she tells a story about giving a talk and how basically it brought her back to why was she denying one piece of herself and not the other. So brought all of her uh, emotional vulnerability and shame research into her organizational development background to write a book about what being a brave leader is and how the bravest leaders can bring in their vulnerabilities and ac- accept their shame and be courageous to become the best leaders they can be. Is it is it dare to lead or daring greatly maybe? Let so me look at my Audible so I can tell you the right <laughs> thing. So since I do a lot of them on Audible, I don't have you know the title in front of me. Dare to right. lead. Brave dare to work. lead. 
Oh my gosh, now it's playing. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get like sued for royalties. Uh Stu- one of Stewart's favorite things, Abby, is to look up the book after the guest recommends it. Tell us the price and how many are left on Amazon. <laughs> That's right. Since there's one left in stock, it's uh, twelve seventy four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul. Did you want to ask anything before we move into the the main topic? Oh, sure. We'll go with the old standby. So you're going to be giving us a lot of advice um, as a teacher. But what's the best advice you received as a learner? I would say. I received a lot of great advice. I think stay curious is probably the best advice. I, t- I told Shreya the best advice I got in my career was don't hit send. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like that one better. <laughs> Which I could never imagine for Abby just because she's, I don't know, her tweets and everything about her is just so joyful. I'm like, what? You were told to not hit send? I think uh, Lincoln used to like write all these like hate mails that he never sent. Supposedly, that was like one of his main uh, big things that he that he was famous for, at least through historians. All right, Trey, you want to get started? Yes. So in terms of we could either do picks of the week or we could do since this is a residency focused episode, we could do what's one of the thing. What's one thing you learned the hard way in residency? Either one. Abby, do you want to start us off? So I I have two. You guys can tell me which one you liked better. Obviously, I learned a lot of things the hard way in residency, but I would say one of them was uh, this this night as an intern, and it was a a very busy night, and lots was signed out to me, and obviously, you're covering lots of different patients, and you're admitting, and you're cross-covering, and you're new, and you're trying to get it all done, and the next morning... I thought I was just the crusader that I had, you know, Mm. admitted those patients and kept everyone alive and done, you know, everything on that to-do list except checked, you know, one little potassium. And I was just feeling like I I had done it all. And the next morning, my resident uh, came to me that the the team whose patient about whom the potassium I was supposed to check it, it was high and it was a really big deal that I didn't check it. And I had such righteous indignation in the beginning of, you know, uh, what about all the potassiums I did check? And what about all the things I did do? And was so set on how many tasks that I completed and how much I did and, and why they should be thanking me or telling me I did a good job for never sleeping and staying up all night and doing these things. And was completely disconnected that every lab and everything on that ta- on that to-do list was connected to a person and a patient and an outcome that mattered. And then it's not good enough to just do everything but one little thing. And often it's the little things that are the big things. And were there things that I did that I could have or should have prioritized differently or, you know, the things that I did spend my time on instead of checking that potassium, were they the right things to do? And did I understand medicine enough to know that that little thing was a big thing uh, and, and was the biggest thing to that person who, you know, who had that? And so I thought that was a really hard lesson, um, not just from the, you know, go back to the Brene Brown, the the shame that came with thinking you did a great job and then being told you didn't, um, but really the realization that I didn't just do a bad job, that I missed that, that I was feeling so righteous about all the things that I did do right, if, if that makes sense. So I thought that was a really hard lesson to learn and a really, really important one because there was just so much to it that I that I got wrong and that I had to think about differently. No, that's a, that's a great point. I think that's like, it just reminds me how medicine is so humbling. You can be like, look, I did 90% of my to-do list, but that, that to-do list is also patients at the end of the day. And that 10% to that one patient could, could, you know, be the difference between arrhythmia versus, you know, something else. So, um, uh, yeah, that's like a wonderful, wonderful lesson of like humility, I think to me. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, this can be this can be cut out because I, I know you only asked for one person, but there was actually a really poignant moment um, it, it, during my my February uh, year or the, the February month of my intern year. My my wife was having some difficulty at home with our kids, and uh, you know you, you kind of think that you can you can do everything on your own. You can you can take care of it. I was on the wards as uh, as an intern, and I was I was given a lot of autonomy because I asked for it, and then. I realized that my 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 house of cards came crashing down. My wife had to be admitted to the hospital, 
And I was just like, what, what do I do about this? And I was, I, w- I was in the hallway just bawling in tears. And uh, I looked next to me, who, the, the room I was standing outside of, it was a guy that was on a trach. He was on a vent. He was a hospice patient in the ICU. And I just walked in there and held his hand, sat down, and he started crying with me. <laughs> it's just really poignant. I, I, like, I, didn't, didn't even, I didn't even know who he was. I just sat down and talked to him for an hour. And he just looked at me and nodded. You know, I, I asked him about his family. And, and he, he looked at me at, at the end of our conversation. He said, he told me to take care of myself. And, and I was like, you know, what, what do you mean? He said, go home. And so right after I talked to him, I called the chief resident. I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm really having a, a really, really hard time. I, I can't do this. And he said, don't worry about it. And that month they gave me off. Um, I, I had a, there was another intern that, that took my spot. And I, I, I thank her so much for taking, the, taking my spot because it really helped to put things in order in my family. I, I really needed that. And I think without that, it really would have caused burnout. And I, I, I just, Matt knows me, you know, I, I will burn out of both ends if you don't tell me to stop. And I think having that conscience really saved me. And I think it's important as a resident that you've got to have that conscience. You have to have that conscience. Without that, you're, you're going to burn out. It doesn't matter. It, it's, it can happen in residency, it can happen as a staff, but you've got to listen to that. You cannot push through it. You're not, you're not a superhuman Thank you so much for sharing that. I think your story shares so much courage and vulnerability. And it reminds me of one of Angela Duckworth's quotes. That's just one of my favorite things that she said was that having grit is not about being invincible, but it's about finding people who love you enough that won't let you quit when you have a bad day. Right. And it sounds like you had this moment where you were brave enough and had the grit and the courage and the wherewithal to acknowledge that you weren't invincible and right. that you needed help, and you found people who loved you enough that that gave you what you needed, and and that you were able to ask for it, and that's tremendous. And, and it, it helps me now as a as a physician leader to identify those same signs in my colleagues. And one of the reasons why I went into the the path that I went to is actually because I walked in a colleague who was who was contemplating suicide. And so you know, you, you just you find out the system is as much at fault as as we are as physicians, but we, we set up this just chaotic system where we expect physicians to just take it all. And we've got to back up and look at the system from more of an objective standpoint and say, what can we do to stop this? Because ultimately, the system will come crashing down, and we're going to be replaced by, you know, who knows what, but something that's that's a little less human. And we've got to be careful with that. Absolutely. They won't be crying with their patients, for sure. <laughs> that's, that's right. So, on to the case, I suppose. I suppose. I think that's well said. Absolutely. All right. So, today at Cashlack Memorial, we have Sarah. Sarah just finished her intern year at Cashlack. And, you know, intern year, she worked really hard um, to always get her tasks done. She was that intern that, like, never wanted to be the rate-limiting step, always worked super hard. And tomorrow, she, it's her first day. Uh, leading the floor team. And she realizes, whoa, wait a minute. I never really went out of my way to learn intern year, you know, and I have nothing to teach tomorrow. Abby, do you have any initial thoughts for Sarah? Yes. So first I would tell Sarah, she is not alone and that I think it is unbelievably common for someone to get to the end of intern year and blink their eyes and think, oh my goodness, what happened? I was so focused on efficiency and getting the task done and trying not to let anybody die on me and learning, you know, sick versus not sick that I didn't read or I didn't learn this. And now I'm supposed to teach and what am I going to do? And everyone's going to be looking at me. Uh, And I think the best thing to tell her is that uh, she's right where she uh, should be and to take a deep breath. And um, as soon as she meets her July one intern, Within minutes, she will know how much she knows, how much she's learned, how ready she is, and how much she has to teach. It takes no less than minutes to uh, to get to that moment, and that it's going to be an incredible year of of more learning, and that it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, the courage and uh, you know is is knowing that you don't know what's coming next, and you're and you're choosing to take that step anyway. And often, growth and comfort don't coexist. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And the more uncomfortable you are, the more you can say, this is what getting better feels like. And just embrace it. Because uh, it's going to be a rocky ride. And you're just going to have the thrill 
uh, of a lifetime and, and come out on the other end uh, even better. Yeah. Embrace that imposter syndrome, right? No, no uh, first, first day resident is like, yeah, I'm ready for this. There's definitely an imposter syndrome that comes with it. And it's um, how to acknowledge that and stay humble and just, you know, buckle in and go. Yeah. So how would you how would you kind of advise her then? So in terms of running workarounds, right? Because that'll be the first thing that she hits in the day. How would you advise her to go about that? Absolutely. So first, I would I would want to hear about what workarounds were like for her. Where who were her, the best residents? What did they do? What was it about it? How did it make her feel? What what was it that really worked about not them as a person, but what they did? And then what were the things that she said to herself? Note to self, I'm not going to do that again. That's not how I'm going to lead the team. And to really learn from that experience and sort of get a sense of what ideal looks like for her. And then I would advise that she have those same discussions with her new intern. So she's starting to lead a team. I don't know now if this is month one, two, or three, but asking the interns, you know, what worked for you without giving me any names? Tell me about the seniors whose work rounds you really got the most from. And what was it about it? What did you really like that you would love to see us do? And without telling me any names, what were some pet peeves? What did you hope? Gosh, I hope my resident never does that again, because gosh, I sure wouldn't want to do that. And and kind of get some input from them. And then be crystal clear about where your expectations are and see where they align and where they don't and negotiate. Uh, but I think the the time when when interns or students become most frustrated with their residents is when they haven't met an, an unsaid expectation. I think for the most part, people come in, the students want to please their residents, the interns want to please their residents, the residents want to please their attending. It sure is easier to do if we just tell people what we're expecting and say it up front. Um, so I would say be be crystal clear with the expectations and really negotiate what works for both of them. So Abby, there's maybe a curse of competence to some extent. And I, I would suspect most of us fall prey to it where it's so easy to do something yourself. You tend not to actually let other people do it. And it's easy to actually continue that habit as things go along until you're just, you're, so this might be early in Sarah's career to be talking about this, but sort of what kind of anticipatory guidance might you give in terms of delegating and what to take on yourself and, and how much distance to give to allow your, your trainees to learn and, and work? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great, Topic. I don't know that there's certainly an easy answer, but I can share some of the um, some of the advice I give to residents, or even that that I try myself. Uh, so first is that it really depends what that intern is able to do and and willing to do. And you can think through the different categories whether they're absolutely able and they may or may not be willing or have the confidence to do it, or they may be completely unable. They just don't have the knowledge or the experience or the wherewithal to, to do the task that's needed, and they may be very willing to do it anyway or not willing. <laughs> and, and those combinations can be dangerous in yep. certain ones. You know, if you're unable and unwilling, then okay, you're safe, you're over here. If you're able and willing, if your intern is able and willing, the last thing you want to do is crush their confidence or frustrate them by being too close, by micromanaging, by hovering. And if it's someone that actually is quite able and they just don't have the confidence, they're not willing, then that's the person you want to really build up. You want to build their confidence. You want to call out their strengths. You want to you know, be there so that they know you're not going to let them hurt anyone, but that you actually believe that they can really do it. And the ones who aren't able for whatever reason – yet are willing are probably the most dangerous combination. And that's where <laughs> just, you know, finding what's meaningful to them and, and saying things like, you know, I really appreciate how much you care about patients and I know you would never want to do anything to hurt them. So let's just make sure each step we're doing the right thing. Or those may be the the interns that you are setting more particular triggers to call you for. So, you know, hey, just so you don't have to know whether or not you want to call me or need to call me, I like to be called for hypotension below this, tachycardia above this, angry families, angry consultants, crucial lab value, you know, for my own neuroses, these are the things I want to hear about. Of course, you know how to handle them. I just want to make sure I'm looped in, those sorts of things. And so you, you kind of learn your scripts around after you've kind of diagnosed your learner, you're going to manage them very differently based on what they need. Um, and then you're going to be checking every order, reading every note, talking to the nurses, and you're going to do that all without that intern knowing, right? Trust, you're going to do that. but verify. Exactly, exactly. 
And then again, you want to make sure that they know I'm not going to let you hurt anybody, but I'm going to let you get pretty close. And then, <laughs> and then you back up and you. Abby, you know, I you, wanted you to get. Carefully. I wanted to get a little specific when you said setting expectations. So as an attending, sometimes I don't always do this. I always talk about expectations like day one, but uh, th- sometimes I hand out a, a paper that actually has like a top five or top 10 expectations. But do, you, do you recommend that residents do something like that where they actually hand something like in writing to the to their interns, like this is what I want, or is it just like a, a team huddle at the beginning of like whenever you start to work together? So great question. And I think a lot will depend on style. So as an attending, absolutely. I have a two page document that we spend 20 minutes on day one going right. over. They um, sign expect- it in front of a notary. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it has, you know, expectations of me, expectation of intern, of student, of resident. We go over how to do a new presentation versus an old one that I expect them to wash their hands, that I expect them to speak politely about patients in and outside of their presence, that everyone on the team has to attract a student into internal medicine. Um, We go over in great detail. I I don't know that I've ever seen a resident hand out a written one, and I certainly didn't as a resident, but I do think that there's an explicit conversation around what's expected. And again, what works, what doesn't work, how do they want to make decisions? How do they want to split up the work? When and how do they want to touch base during the day? Being on the same page for those are incredibly important and will lead to to better success. When I was a, a resident, I would always send out an email the day before, setting the tone for my team. Um, this the expectation of of kind of like where we want to meet and whatnot was one thing, but always like, okay, what is your one teaching goal and what is your one wellness goal? And I always said to them, and this was more like the next day when we met, is that just as important as like patient safety, and that's like the number one thing of like we're going to take great patient care on our team, but just as important as that is um, their wellness and inspiring their right. curiosity and setting that stage up front. And then like writing down like, okay, your well, Susie, your wellness goal is to like drink, you know, four glasses of water. I'm going to make that happen. Or we're going to work as a team to make that happen. You know, we're going to do ins and outs. We're going to put your ins and outs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much they appreciate just like someone being like, oh yeah, you didn't drink water today. Or, um, you know, or, or like, uh, uh, you know, taking the stairs or, or whatever, whatever it is, or checking in, getting coffee. Um, uh, but yeah, so so yeah, I thought I found that very helpful in terms of an email the day before they can know kind of I'm this, I'm a resident who's available, present for them, Mm -hmm. and really interested in their learning, setting that message. And then like the more nitty gritty of like, I want to run the list three times in the day at this time, this, you know, that that nitty gritty stuff is like, I feel like more the negotiating in person thing. I love that. And I and I think to your point, you know, when you when you do things like that, you're not just showing them that you're interested in their learning, but you're interested in them. And so sometimes even asking, you know, who else is in their life or what's important to them, whether it's a kid or a spouse or a pet, um, what they're going home to, you know, sometimes people make assumptions, oh, you're, you don't have kids, so you there's nothing to go home to, or you have, you know, different, <laughs> yeah. right? I yeah. mean, there's so many assumptions right. that are made and people have yes. things in their life. Maybe it's their band that they practice. Maybe it's their church choir. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is to spend those first few minutes talking about who they are, what's important to them about medicine, what's important to them outside of medicine, love the wellness goal. Um, it, I think that that goes a long way in kind of creating that learning environment, which is going to make all the teaching more impactful and powerful. Well, it just, it saves so much time. I, I send out a document. Oh, here comes the train coming past. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, love it. <laughs> so, is that the R5, R100? It's not. Shreya, we don't want to give too much information about Paul's location. Yeah, There's a lot of fans. <laughs> There's a lot of fans yeah, right. who have been looking for him. Oh, and I'm getting human hair on the mail. I don't need that. <laughs> So no, I send out a document uh, ahead of time. It is, it makes rounds so much more efficient so that I don't have to ask if someone gives me a hemoglobin, I don't have to ask what the trend is or what the MCV, right. just minor details that we probably take for granted. And you kind of learn as you become an upper year. If I just send those, make those expectations clear, if there's a chest X-ray, I'm going to want to look at it. Yes. And if you just sort of set that up ahead of time, it makes, so they refer to it as my manifesto. So I should probably <laughs> change the tone maybe, but uh, it's... It saved me so much time and also just sort of minor irritations that by the end of three hour rounds, I'm not lost. I've not lost my mind because they they kind of know exactly what 
I'm hoping will get accomplished. So it's 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 such a great advice. I was e- exceptionally anal retentive as a, as a senior resident. Probably no surprise to anyone that knows me. I would actually give them a folder. In that folder would have an example of a uh, progress note and H and P, and then the basically the expectations for the the rotation what what we were going to do the idea was and and I told them told them this up front was that I want to make their documentation easy on them so that we can actually focus on what's important I don't want them to focus on reinventing the wheel and so when when we got to the electronic medical record I would give them a template that they could just tab through and then put in so that they could be they could actually be done with the progress notes before we started rounding because I wanted progress notes done then so that we could actually see patients talk to them and do what doctors are supposed to do not necessarily just document all day long. Amazing. I think residents play such a big part in helping their interns be efficient. Stuart, you you found the way. I couldn't I can never get my interns to finish their progress note before <laughs> rounds. But <laughs> well, you now found now way. as an attending, I just entice them with food or, you know, whatever I can find that they like. Right, right. I love it. And I think that's another point of where expectations are so important. I usually tell my teams I don't care when you do your notes. I want you to take care of the patients. I want you to know what's going on. I want you to be present for the day. The documentation is just something you have to do at some point that we all need to do, but that, you know, your, your job for the day is to make sure that Mm -hmm. the patient has what they need and don't feel like you need to get a note in just so that I can agree with it. I do think you've got to kind of balance that because in larger hospitals, sometimes that, that note is the only thing that really communicates the nurses. So you, you, even if it's just something that says, this is what we're going to do, we might discharge this patient today, you know, something like that. So I, I, I wasn't saying that I want them to focus on the, the documentation, but that I want it to not be a, a hindrance to the, the medical care that we provide. Sure, absolutely. So we were sort of just wrapping up talking about uh, talking about how we set expectations with the team. So what do you want to do next? Yeah, so we set so we set expectations. Um, and the next part, I think we kind of delved on a little bit, but I think we can get into a little bit more is kind of the tips for helping her with workarounds and teaching. Um, she's a little nervous about, you know, should she teach on the fly versus prepare? Um, what are the concrete teaching points she's going to teach about? How would you kind of guide her through that? Absolutely. So I think I would answer to the first question, yes, you should prepare and you should be ready to teach on the fly. And I think being very deliberate and thoughtful about what are the teachable moments and where do you want to teach and what do you want to teach about can help because sometimes there's so many teachable moments that if you take advantage of all of them, rounds go too long, the interns are, you know, will start resenting you because they need to finish their notes or get to conference or whatever. And if you miss too many teaching opportunities, you know, then then you're not teaching. And so to really think about when and where is not just a teachable moment, but actually a, a good and opportune teachable moment. And being deliberate before, you know, you go into whatever rooms you're going to go in together to see the patient with the interns or with the students, or even if you've got a staff or faculty with you as well, are we going into this room? to point out an interesting physical exam finding or how to do an aspect of a physical exam? Are we going in to have a difficult conversation? Are we going in to tell bad news? Are we going in to elicit a piece of the history that was left out that's maybe more sensitive and they don't know how to ask? And so I think being really thoughtful about the purpose in every room, the resident can really teach that to the intern of, you know, certainly we're going to go in and check on things and see what's going on. But in this room, we're going to go in, we really want to concentrate on the belly exam, or let's really talk about that new diagnosis and see what her understanding is of was that expected or not? And and how are we going to talk through it? And the more deliberate the resident can be the night before or the morning of kind of looking at the list and saying, you know, whatever rooms we're going into, what what would success look like and what's our purpose of going in that room? It can also help you from from getting lost or having it get overtaken and get more confident with whatever your teaching points are. And I think it also opens up the point and is a nice reminder to the resident that there's so much more to teaching than the medical facts that they'll share. You can teach physical exam. You can read Bates the night before knowing that you've got a patient on your service with some interesting exam finding. Your intern students don't have to know that you did that. And you can walk in and be like, you know what? Let's, let's, let's go over the heart exam here <laughs> and and blow them away with the terms you're using or the you know, just you, you can you can show them things that maybe two days ago you didn't actually know or do either, but you're becoming better at your craft because you're preparing to teach it. 
Uh, and better yet, maybe you tell the intern, hey, tomorrow you're going to walk us through Mrs. Smith's lung exam. Go read it if you have to and let them wow the medical student. And so also kind of setting up the people on your team to teach something is going to help everybody learn more. But I think being deliberate about what you want to do, whether, and, and they may think you're teaching on the fly, but you know that you've actually really prepared for that moment. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would just say, in addition to priming them for what they're going to learn, I would also suggest always try to label the teaching moment because oftentimes like interns are messing and be like, oh, we just did Scott work all day. We didn't, we didn't, I don't know if I even learned anything today. But if you say like, okay, so we're going to do some teaching today about evaluating dementia or altered mental status in this patient. Um, and then and then when you go in and you sign the intern to lead that conversation on 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 uh, dementia evaluation, then give give feedback and also label that feedback <laughs> because they're like, oh I didn't right. get feedback. <laughs> like, no, 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 we <laughs> we're doing feedback. Um is also uh what what I would say. Um That's a huge point. Yeah. I, you know, our friend uh Daryl and Moyer, that was something she always taught where you say, I'm going to give you feedback now, because if you're not absolutely explicit about it, people think that it's kind of passing. You're just making conversation about how nice their presentation was. So, yeah, make sure that you're actually being explicit. I think that's a great point. And I would even do that with, you know, again, teaching not just the, the factoids or pearls or physical exam that you're about to do. But often I'll start out back to that sort of expectations in the beginning and I'll say, I'm a generalist, so I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm not going to know everything. But what I think I am good at is thinking and reasoning and coming up with good questions that we can answer together and then role modeling that and calling that teaching as well. And sometimes the best teaching that you can do is actually facilitating someone else's learning. And if you can create an environment that that engages their curiosity and their desire to ask questions and to look them up and to find answers, I think we'll actually have done a lot more for our learners than the transfer of whatever factoids we share with them that they may or may not remember. But if we can instill in them a safety to, to not know, to be curious, to dig deeper, to put their nickel down, to be safe and feel safe putting their nickel down, whether they're right or wrong, they're not going to forget any of that. And I'll even do things if I'm asking them questions and they don't know, I'll give them, ask if they want a hint and I'll give them a rhymes with. So I'm clearly <laughs> telling them the answer, right? But right. they're not going to forget it because they're going to giggle, they're going to figure it out, and they still got the answer on their own. Even uh, if I say rhymes with schmendocarditis, right? Yeah. Like they're going to they're gonna get there. That's good. Yeah. I, I, permission to use that. Please, yeah. Abby. I was gonna. You reminded me of this quote. Uh, the, the book. There's a book, Whiplash, that I read recently. It was about the MIT Media Lab, uh, or largely. It was written by those people and largely about that lab. But they were talking about like education is something that you do to other people. Learning is something you do to yourself. Your ed- education is something other people do to you, and learning is something you do to yourself. Like it's it's on you to learn something. You can't really. You can't make somebody learn something, but you, it's more like you inspire them, you send them in the right direction, you give them the tools for them to learn something, but we can't like, uh, ultimately they have to do the hard work of, of learning the fact. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I love that. And I think that's so important. I saw a quote once that said, it's not about how old learners teach, it's about how, sorry, old teachers teach, but new learners learn, that it's so much more about their learning that our teaching than our teaching. And if we're facilitating their learning and creating that environment of inquiry and discovery and interest and curiosity, they will walk away with so much more. And they may not look back at us as, oh, that was such a good teacher, because all they're going to remember is all the things that they learned. And that's okay, because what we really want them is to learn more and know more and develop lifelong learning skills that they're going to take away. It's, it's not about us or whether they remember that we helped facilitate or not. And I think the more that, that we're in the background is just sort of a silent, or not silent, but facilitator of their learning, I actually think they're going to get that much more out of it. I think another thing I really like doing, and I have more occasion to do this than I would like to admit, is... Um, teaching for my mistakes. So I go into a room and I disclose bad news and the patient falls apart or I, I go in and talk to the patient. I usually think that I'm fairly good with patients, but they get angry with me and it just it just devolves or just things don't go the way you hope. I actually like coming outside the room and then doing a post-mortem with learners and be like, that was a disaster. <laughs> what, what, what can we, what could, how, what could have I done differently or better that time around and actually engaging in that conversation? Um, 
Well, that's awesome because Paul, you're creating a safe space for them, for them to then be like, you know what, Dr. Williams, like, I think I really like could have done a better job talking to Mr. So-and-so this morning about their diagnosis and being open to asking you how they can better themselves on on that as well. So I think that's, that's awesome. I think that's like the humbling thing I learned as well when I first started as a resident. I, again, was so afraid to actually teach on the fly because for me, I was like Sarah, where I was like, what am I going to teach them? <laughs> I'd always get in early, I'd prepare, and I'd, I'd love trying to be creative, being like, okay, well, how can I make teaching hyperbilirubinemia into like a game or something like that? Like, how can I invoke active learning, right? And then I'm, I'm pretty hardcore and I always ask my med students and my, and my interns at the end of the day, I'm like, so what did you guys learn today? Because if I also, in, in addition to safe space, I want to make a space for them to reflect and name what they learned. Because like, as you guys know, the forgetting curve within 24, 48 hours, they're probably going to forget most of the things I taught them, right? And I was always humbled for the majority of the time when I asked, hey, what'd you guys learn? They wouldn't talk about like the 20 minute chalk talk I gave on hypertensive mm -hmm. urgency meds. They would be like, oh yeah, I really liked, you know, how we talked to Mr. So-and-so about the uncertainty of the diagnosis or like how to do a goals of care discussion. And I was like, wait, what? How about, <laughs> that?" Just <laughs> so I think I, maybe it goes to like the hidden curriculum and you, that there's so much more um, to be, to be taught than the, than the factoids. And then also, I think one thing I also learned the hard way is to, um, relieve myself. If say we had a morning where we had like three, four admissions to be like, look, the priority is patient care at the moment. I can teach in the afternoon. I can send out an email with teaching points and articles there. There just because it's like a, there's a, a unsaid schedule of workarounds. I can give myself the leeway, of when to teach. And then there was always like an some other fun things that I tried out that I really liked if anyone can get inspiration from this. But for example, like my interns or sub I would always get paged uh, when we were doing workarounds. So I set, I set this up front and uh, made it like, make sure, made sure everyone was okay with this. But I would have, whenever that team member would come back, I'd make the med student or someone else summarize the teaching point they missed. Um, and so that would allow some kind of like elaboration, someone to summarize in their own words um, and then make that team member feel situated again. Cause that person that came back is probably just thinking about the nursing call that they got. <laughs> but also in a, a way like also reflects um you know, kind of summarizing the point another time in their own words and kind of um, really uh, working on their learning. Any, any like creative tips for workarounds, guys? Enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> uh, Shrey, just to clarify, the workarounds that we're talking about, you're talking about the workarounds that would happen in the morning before the formal attending rounds or teaching rounds where your attending's there and you're sort of formally presenting patients and doing a little bit of extra teaching, going to the bedside. Exactly. Okay. What are your thoughts about, so uh, this is actually for Shreya, what, what are your thoughts about the attending uh, on work rounds with you in order to get the rounds, um, let's say yes. you need speedy rounds, like, is that something that you like or don't like? I, okay, so, in, and then in the end, I kind of started advocating for that more, Um because then everyone was on the same page at the same time. To me, I'm still perplexed, and maybe Abby, you have a different thought about this, I'm still a little uh, I don't know how to say this, but what is, if the resident rounds, I think the only difference between resident rounds and attending rounds is to let the resident feel autonomy and try to take right. a stab at the plans. But if the attending is there who appreciates the autonomy, gives the resident the autonomy, and it's, it's kind of like a um, kind of a backstage expert and like chimes in whenever the team is going array, I think that's good and efficient as well. So one of the things that I that I do early on also with that early expectations thing to set them up to succeed on attending rounds or teaching rounds or whatever you would call them with me is that everyone's job is to make the rest of the team look good. So that intern's job is to prep that student so that when that student presents whatever he or she is is ready to do that they that they nail it that they have it and there is nothing more deflating for a student and often an intern than that key critical piece that everyone's waiting on. And then the intern jumps in and says, I've got the answer, as opposed to yeah. you know, whisper it to him or them or handing it over that critical, whatever test result we're waiting for or consultant note, et cetera. So I think, you know, the intern, the best thing they can do is prep that student and think, 
help them think through what's the resident going to ask you? What's the attending going to ask you? How do we make sure that you know it? Let's make, let's find out all the things you don't know now so we can help you look good later. And I think the more the resident on work rounds can do the same for the intern and think through not just, you know, how do we efficiently get this and what's our plan for the day, but to actually think knowing this attending, what are they going to ask? What are they going to want to know about? What's a key article here that you can quote and that the, that resident can can just boost that intern's confidence like nothing by by giving them you know thinking through with them what what's going to be asked giving them the key article helping them look good so that when the attending comes you know they just see that student shine or that intern shine and the resident can stand back and be silent and it may look like the resident's not much doing much at all but the savvy ones know that resident worked really hard to make the intern look that good. And that intern look, worked really hard to make the student mm-hmm. look that good. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I would say when I think of the prep earlier, you're not you're, you're coming up with your plans and you're repleting the potassium and you're doing those things on work rounds. But really what you're doing is you're, you're getting your show ready. Um, and, you know, in, in the end, you just you want to be able to, to make your team look excellent. And I think that's the job of, of the resident for the intern and the intern and the student is to, is to get them ready. This sounds like maybe we're moving into the discussion of leadership, which we did have on the agenda. Uh, so Shreya, did you have like a, a case vignette that you wanted to, uh, to bring us into this? Yeah. I mean, so let's get back to Sarah then. So Sarah, you know, ends up doing work rounds, maybe teaching a little bit on GI bleeds. Um, we do the show with with the attending uh and then she you know she feels relieved she feels a little confident in herself um and then the day goes on she's thinking a little bit more about how to lead her team in terms of should she be micromanaging should she be a little bit more hands off and kind of how would you advise her in terms of leading her team sure so one more just last teaching thing i want to say that i think um hopefully can also go in the residence back pocket i mean we talked a lot about you know, making folks look good, preparing, thinking about what you want to do when you go into the room, being cognizant of all that you're teaching, even when not teaching as far as what they're watching you do or not do or say or not say. Um, You can also have a couple of canned talks to keep in your back pocket that I think can be really effective as a senior. And whether it's a canned physical exam, or I think I told you at one point, you know, my favorite one was to talk about narrow complex tachycardias. And at any moment, at any time, at any hour, on any topic, I could pull out a pen and paper and say, let's talk about narrow complex tachycardia. And in fact, I hope none of them are listening. I did this with my team. (laughs) (laughs) They're definitely Um, listening. And um, although they all think it's tonight, not in January. So so (laughs) maybe they'll miss it or or forget by then. But um, I think when you have a few things that you just, whether you have to read it a you know, a dozen times to get good at it. Like, you know, which RTA has the, you know, type four, which is the hyperkalemia, you know, whatever thing that you kind of think about a lot and read a million times so that you learn it, that may be the thing that becomes your can talk, or maybe there's just something you're really interested in. But when you can then find the patient to give your can talk, it looks like you're doing teaching on the fly, but, and you are in that you've decided in that moment to do it, but it's something that you're ready to do and you're ready to draw out and ask them the questions. And if you can build three or four or five of those over, you know, the second half of your intern year and early into your second year, the second half of second year and third year, you can coast on those five can talks forever. Hopefully you're still asking <laughs> questions and looking things right. up, et cetera, but you can always go back to those. So as far as your your question about, you know, how how she should manage, I think a lot of times early on we think about what kind of leader we want to be. You know, am I the leader that's going to be more hands-off? Am I going to be the leader that's hands-on? You know, what did I like? I want to be like this senior but not like that senior. And then I think we realize it's not necessarily about how we want to lead or who we are but what our learners need from us. And that's where I think we can really step up as as the more impactful leaders of the team, when we're adapting to the needs of, does a learner need us to just kind of stay out of their way and really build up their confidence? Do they need us right there because they know what to do, but they're scared to do it without our presence? And sort of spending a day or two really deciding where they are on that able and willing scale we talked about a little bit earlier, I think you'll have a much more productive 
rotation and really give them what they need um, rather than seeing it as a like finding ourselves or what our own um, style is. I think it's important to understand what our own style is, but then that's what we're going to take with us when we think about the seniors we liked or didn't like, which may have as much to, you know, more about us than them. And so again, with our interns and students, it's more about them than us. I wanted to just share a, a personal thing. I found the transition from intern year to re- to, re- to like being a junior resident was very tough because I was a good intern because I was very self-sufficient and like I could micromanage the heck out of myself. And then <laughs> it was very hard for me to trust other people's work and to just f- sort of figure out what was a good organization Uh uh, like for for how to run the day and how I was going to keep track of the million tasks I had, so I, I really struggled with the leadership thing. So I just wanted to just mention to people out there. I mean, I'm still reading lots of books on leadership. I'm still talking to people like Abby and my other colleagues and constantly asking them questions about how they do things because this is like not something that you you might not perfect your leadership style. You shouldn't. You won't perfect your leadership style in residency, but you should think about it and work on it. Um, I, I just wanted to throw that in there so people aren't feeling like if they're not doing these things or if they haven't thought about them, no matter where they are along their journey, that they there's always time that you can improve on these things. I think, Matt, that's an incredible point. And I am in the same boat as you. I'm still learning as a leader. I'm still growing. I wouldn't be reading Dare to Lead or whatever. Yes, Dare to Lead. <laughs> <laughs> what what uh, is the name if, of the book? If, if I had it figured out and, I, and I'm and i directing one of the largest residency programs in the country and, and I'm still learning. And I think right. that, you know, I would hope that, that most of us who have the honor and opportunity to be in a position to lead really see it as a, as a lifelong journey and something that we continue to try to do. Um, and I'll tell you from that book, this is one of the quotes I hoped I would get a chance to say, and this may be that perfect moment, but Brene Brown uh, in, in this book very early on described leadership as she said that a leader is anybody that takes the responsibility to recognize the potential in people and processes and has the courage to nurture and develop that potential. And so any of us and all of us are leaders who look for the strengths and the potential in others and do our best to bring it out. And that's every intern with their student. That's every resident with their intern. I hope that's every faculty with their trainees, that we look for people's potential and we do anything and everything we can to harness it and to build them up so that they can meet that potential. And you can do that day one. And, the, and you're a leader. And so there's skills you're going to continue to develop the rest of your career. But if you look for people's strengths and potential instead of their weaknesses, and you just figure out what they're good at and make them feel really good about that, you're going to be a great senior resident. That's a spectacular point. I, I feel like the idea of being a leader is daunting because I, I don't know, just my immediate mental picture when you say leader is some steely eye lunatic who sleeps two hours a night and, and yells at people. <laughs> so like I, I think the idea that you're there fostering potential and making sure things go the way that they're supposed to when everyone does their best is really kinder and probably more accurate description of leaders. I I think that's a really fantastic point to make. And in some ways I think hits on like a pain point. I, or yeah, something I feel like sometimes I see residents be like, Oh, my intern sucks or my team is this. But I think if you see it as, as no, it's, it's your job to then lift this intern up. So this intern might not, might still be at the reporter stage and is not as good of a interpreter or management. That's okay. They're an intern. Um, you're there to recognize their their potential and and, and bring them up um, instead of you know kind of just brooding or complaining that this isn't like the all star intern that you you were or you wanted. Um, and so I, I I I really enjoy that quote. That was really great. I love also the point that you make, Shreya. Um, and thank you for loving Brene Brown with me, um, that, you know, often, and I think this is one of the more dangerous things that residents can do and something that I would definitely encourage all residents to stay away from is labeling the intern as a good intern, a bad intern, the strong intern, the A plus intern, because it's so situational. The intern that is completely able and willing on their cardiology rotation may be a completely different person on the nephrology because that's just not what they love or what they've read a lot about Mm -hmm. or what they've learned. And so it doesn't always translate. These are not intrinsic properties of the intern. It just speaks to what they've read, what their experience was in medical school, what they have an affinity 
affinity towards. And so their able, their ability and their willingness in one place may not in any way translate to their ability or willingness somewhere else. And if we pre-label them, you know, we're not giving them the chance. That's not seeing their potential. That's doing the opposite of that. And so our job is to not pass along, you know, rumors or labels or anything that's going to hurt them, but to see their potential in every different rotation, wherever they are, meet them where they're at and help them get as far as they can go. I've definitely been burned by that, where I made the mistake of calling someone like an all-star intern. And yeah, they were like a rock star in their AFib management, but like they really needed more guidance for their hematuria management and, you know, let let something go by a little bit. <laughs> I think everyone needs more guidance on hematuria management. Don't we all? But, <laughs> but, but yeah. I've, uh, no, a day goes by. I don't worry about my hematuria management. <laughs> Absolutely. It keeps me up some nights. <laughs> Completely. And, you know. Ooh, and, yeah. That's a pun. So we're talking about this leadership thing. Let's let's say you have an intern who is is struggling in an area. How should the resident bring that up? Like let's say it's been 3 days and you just realize this this person I'm working with, they seem like they they need a little bit extra help. How do you bring that how do you like it's it's awkward to bring that up. You can't just be like, "Hey, you're not doing a good job." I guess you could, but that's probably going to ruin the relationship. So how do you recommend they approach that? Great question. So I think often checking in of where their level of insight is because sometimes people may be struggling and it's, we think it's the elephant in the room and they're just waiting and hoping and praying that someone will bring it up and help them. And so I think just asking them, how do you think this is going? And if you get, Oh, everything's great or everything stinks, then you got to get a little bit more specific. How did it go with Mrs. Jones? Oh, I think she really likes me. How did it go with Mrs. Jones when we talked about her hematuria? Um, and so you keep, you know, get going going in with more detail until you get a level of insight. You know, what do you think you did well? And sort of starting, well, I, you know, I could think through. I, I recognize that red is not normal in the urine. Great, that that was good. Was there anywhere where you feel like you weren't? you know, where you need it or or that we didn't give the patient everything that they deserve from us. And sometimes bringing it back to what the patient should get from us helps remove it from our ego of what we know or don't know or think we can or shouldn't do. If we bring it back to did the patient get our best or are there, or did, were we not curious enough? Were there things that we maybe anchored a little bit too early or didn't think broad enough or ordered tests that maybe were either too detailed, too expensive, not the right ones when we could have thought more about this? So I think, I think using we, and then I think trying to get insight as to where they are. And then if we bring it back to the patient, it's a lot easier to think about. And then I think also instead of like, what'd you do wrong? How, if we saw this again, what, what would we do this time? What did we learn from that? You know, I'm feeling like we could have done a better job with some of this. And so I think having it be conversation, sometimes having it be positively framed, you know, sometimes you just have to give direct feedback, right? If there's an error, if there's something, but when it's really just an opportunity to think differently or to reason better or fill a knowledge gap, I think there's a way to really stand with them on their side and look at the problem together, then be on opposite sides with them. And you can actually physically do that and physically be with them facing the problem so that they actually feel you and see you on their side as you talk about, you know, where, where you think that they can get to, where they want to get to. Is that something that they even want? And what's their motivation to getting there? And sometimes you can go back to that first day of rounds of what's really important to them and bring it back to something they've already told you is really important or that something that they see as a skill set. You know, you are so good at thinking, you know, in a, in a logical way. I love how logical you are and how linear you are. I wonder if sometimes that limits you from thinking outside of that. Has, have you ever heard that before? Has anyone said that to you before? Oh yeah, I have heard that. And so, well, sometimes if I get stuck, I think this way and giving them next time try. I really like that language that um, from Angela Duckworth, also from grit of, you know, instead of you did this wrong or do this better, like, oh, next time try this. Um, and inviting next time tries. I, I ask my, my residents, my team, my chiefs all the time, give me a next time try. How could this have been more effective? How could this have been more meaningful? And sort of more role modeling that so that they're excited and they want a next time try. I agree in terms of asking asking them also kind of what can I do better for you? Get you know we were just talking about leadership and so get feedback on your own leadership skills while you're, while you're there too while you're giving feedback and debriefing something as well. Um, were they just afraid to like talk to you and tell you about the hematuria or um, or was there something else going on? 
Yeah. And I think to, I think it was Paul that made the point earlier of sharing our own mistakes of, you know, gosh, I remember when I was a resident and I, and I mishandled the hematuria and to this day I carry it with me and I don't want that for you. So let's talk through how this went because I don't want you to carry for 22 years, (laughs) this missed blah, blah, blah in hematuria, you know, (laughs) it's just been eight, just eight years. (laughs) Ay, ay, ay. Okay, I think I'll move us along then. So Sarah, you know, she gets home from her first day as being a resident. It's it's a long day, but she's kind of wondering to herself, okay, I'm a, I'm a resident now. Like, what should I be reading? What should I be studying? Yeah. So this is the this is the age old question, and and I will answer it like eight million people before have read about your patients. Um, I really do b- believe in that. I think that um, sometimes in in med school and maybe intern year, it's fun to take the challenge of, you know, I'm going to read Harrison's beginning to end by the by the end of the year (laughs) or sort of taking on some of those things as often students or interns do. And you can learn a lot of sort of facts that way and kind of a, you know, at least plant a seed so that when you see something later, you remember where to go in Harrison's to look it up again. But I really think for things to stick, it's just unbelievable how much they stick when it's about Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith or about that patient. And even more if it's about an unanswered question that you have. So instead of just going home and saying, I'm going to read about bolus pemphigoid, you know, really saying, now, which were the, what are the medicines again that can cause this versus, you know, really having a specific answerable question and, and kind of keeping a note card and looking those up, I think will, um, will be even more sophisticated. So I would say, you know, first, just reading about your patients in general and their diseases. And um, I love the review articles, whether they're New England Journal or Annals. Um, I absolutely love the in the clinic, you know, that might be the primary care doc in me, but I actually think they're incredible for a lot of inpatient bread and butter medicine that we see as well. I love the questions at the end. And so I think those can be really helpful. And then pushing ourselves and our teams to come up with a few clinical questions, even on rounds and say, okay, who wants to look what up for tomorrow? Or, you know, the end of rounds, what are our unanswered questions from today that we want to come back with by tomorrow? And I think those are a good way to guide the reading, to keep you interested. Always close the loop. If you ask your student or intern or resident to look something up and then you don't give them the chance to report it back, they're never going to look it up again when you say it. Right. Um, and so I think closing the loop and, and making a little like box for you to check as well on, on what are the things you've assigned. Um, yeah. And I that's think, also, oh, sorry. Right. No, go for it. I was just going to say that's a great tip for the resident who, where the intern or student asked them a question on rounds that they have no idea. And so one possible answer is obviously, hmm, I have no idea. Let's look that up together. Or great question. Why don't you tell us about that tomorrow on rounds? Yeah. Uh, and, and your intern will never know which, which, uh, what you actually knew or didn't. So you can always keep that in your back pocket, residents. I always forget to do that 30 <laughs> seconds until it's too late. I'm like, oh, I could have just feigned knowledge and asked. You know, right, like, right, right, right. No. <laughs> you tell me. What am I? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> actually, this is this was a particularly like stressful thing for me when I was an intern and a second year resident when people would tell me, just go home and read about your patients. And for me, I think maybe speaks to like more, my more like methodological person person to me where I was like, no, 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 I need strategies. Like you can't just tell me to go and read about my patients. I like don't know. Should I go to up to date? Should like, what should I do? There's so much to choose from. And um, so I started asking a lot of my attendings and people I respected for strategies. And some of the some of the more consistent strategies I I heard was, you know, they would take a note card and write down the questions that they had for the day and then would not leave the hospital after they signed out until those questions were answered. And that was like the one consistent thing that they did every day. Or I had one one friend who's now he monk fellow who gave herself 15 minutes of homework every day. It was just like, I'm going to look up one thing. It's my 15 minutes for my learning and did that consistently. And now, honestly, those were things I did not adopt, unfortunately. The the small things I did end up doing was, um, like, say, for example, I saw a patient in clinic that had multiple sclerosis. Um, I would then do all the mix-up questions related to multiple sclerosis, so kind of make things count twice. But then, like, if there were particular questions, then try to find a review article. 
I mean, I, and I definitely made a point to try to do it consistently. Did I always do that? No, maybe two, three times a week, but it, it did pay off dividends. Just even, even like relieving my stress, my, my stress that it needs to be like sitting down and reading. It's like, it can be 15 minutes on the subway. It can be 15 minutes. Um, you know, and so, so that, that was really, um, helpful. And then just the one other thing that would also stress me out was just distinguishing that like, uh, the reading at home, there's two different types. There's reading to like stay up to date. And then there's reading about basics. And I, I, cause I always kept hearing like, Oh, everyone goes home and like, looks at like journal watch and like looks at JAMA articles and things like that. For me, it helped me kind of just say like, you know what, I'm a second year resident. I'm still learning the management of tumor lysis syndrome. I can't, I'm not at the point where I, I can un- appreciate the nuances of the latest cancer drug or the latest management of uh, anticoagulation yet. I'm I'm still learning the basics. And so that helped me kind of say, uh, that ca- kind of helped me like gear my learning and not feel like I needed to keep up with all the latest emails and latest studies and let let me relieve myself to just uh, learn the management that I needed to. And then now that I'm an attending, I feel more, okay, I can appreciate the nuances that comes in Journal Watch and the latest studies more. You know, I we love talking about our guilt on the show. One of my main guilt, <laughs> one of my main guilty things as a med student, which was ridiculous, was that I wasn't like keeping up with the primary literature. No one ever told me that it wasn't my job to do that until I was right. an attending. <laughs> so I, I'd like, you know, I had like these, these stacks of medical journals that were getting sent to my house. I, I barely understood what they were talking, the nuances of what they were talking about, and I, so I think it's an. I think it's important to point this stuff out. Like, I mean, medical students and residents should largely be doing like question banks and textbook knowledge. And then you know, if they have a specific question in a patient that they're t- and they're kind of looking it up for the team, then that's a chance to look at the primary literature. But just kind of trying to scan the hundred thousands of or the thousands of journal articles that come out each month is just like ridiculous. <laughs> um I think if they want to follow the Journal Watch emails and just read the headlines and see if there's like a topic that they're really interested in that they want to keep track of. Um, but it's it's hard. I mean, we we try to do that for the show, right, guys? Like we're trying to like just Paul, Paul's like – Paul Paul made the quote a couple of weeks ago. He's like, I love how it's like 2018 and we're just talking about this new kid aspirin with all these, <laughs> <laughs> with all these recent uh, things. So it, yeah, it's hard. Residents, I, I just, I think residents, uh, if they're like me and they're feeling guilty for not crushing the primary literature, I don't think that's what they should be doing. Um, this is a fun fact, but Wado and I were actually CICU residents together. And there was a third, speaking of steely-eyed maniac, whom I'm sure he's doing now, I won't, I won't call him out by name, but I'd be... He'd be citing, you know, heart failure trials that came out the year before. And I just be, I just need this patient to still have a pulse. Like, that's fantastic that you know that. But I, I can't even. Anyway, good memories. We can cut this part out. But. <laughs> it, it reminds me of, oddly, when when my brother used to say that the Spencers were the best dressed kids in last year's clothes. Because my mom <laughs> would get everything from, you know, Marshalls and TJ Maxx in the back. And I think that often in residency, like, you, we are the best dressed kids in last year's clothes, you know. And, and I think going to the review articles and reading the pre-digested and, um, you know, things that, you know, again, whether it's the annals in the clinic or some of the New England or annals reviews, they're really helpful with the basics and especially the ones that start with a clinical case and walk you through what the great, you know, what the questions are, what's the evidence. You're, you're actually reading very high level evidence-based medicine that's digested for you in a way to let you learn the basics. And then you can always go to the primary article. And again, like you said, if you're keeping a list of your clinical questions, you can go to the primary literature for those. Um, But when you're just trying to build up your understanding of the basics, it's going to help with your clinical reasoning. It's going to help with your differentials. It's just going to let you get more volume in so that you can think smarter and think broader. Because if we only anchor to what we know, and we're going really deep on just a few topics, we, we lose the breath. And so I think really concentrating on getting the breath that helps us think more widely. And then you can get more concrete, certainly as you go up in your career and also as the patient needs dictate. At our, our uncle Bob, uh, the great Dr. Bob Centaur has, I believe he had a MedRants blog post about this recently where he just talked, he has this five good minutes that he s- sends out on Twitter every day. And that is sort of, li- I, I believe he said it was based on his, this habit that where someone just told him, spend five minutes a night reading about a patient or something that you saw today. And I like the five minutes, like, because it's a, it's like a micro goal. It's like, 
five minutes is not that long. Like everyone probably has five minutes and maybe you'll end up reading longer if you get interested. So I think setting the bar pretty low as to like what you're going to read is, is a nice hack and you might end up reading for 10 or 15 minutes on the topic. Tweets only take a few seconds. So I'm good. Tweets only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Twitter, Twitter is a good way to keep up. I mean, I just talked about how to not don't don't stress too much about keeping up with literature, but Twitter is also an excellent way to to learn um, as well. Absolutely, and I actually love Matt's comment about sometimes you know we need to set the bar really low, whether it's for ourselves or our team, so we can trip over it, build a little confidence, and slowly like lift it up again. And so you know, a lot of us may have overachieving tendencies and that can be hard to overcome, but sometimes deliberately lowering the bar, not with the care of a patient, but with, you know, whatever expectations we've set for ourselves or someone else. And then we really truly enable people to, to leap over that bar. And then we can probably rise it, lift it higher than we could have otherwise, if we sort of start with it lower and build it up and let people build the confidence of their knowledge or their thinking and their decision making. And so being very deliberate with our praise and seeing those strengths and lifting the bar and lifting the bar. I don't know if it's ever been studied, but I really bet you can just get people so much further than they ever thought by by going with them and steadily increasing it when you because if you start too high and you shoot their confidence then you lose the safety of putting their nickel down and being willing to be wrong and that's almost always where the magic happens is when you can get the safety of someone willing to show you what they don't know they will get we all get so much more out of things and we can learn to such an important and impactful degree when instead of concentrating on showing off what we know, we can acknowledge the vulnerability and be present with what we don't. And then we've got people all around us who want to help us get it and acquire it and learn it. And so I think if we can give that to our teams, that's one of the greatest gifts I think a resident can give an intern as well. Absolutely. I think we should probably go to take home points and definitely we want to do more of these episodes. Uh, Hopefully, the interns, residents, students listening to this will find this really helpful. I think they will. Mm-hmm. But uh, unless anyone has any last minute questions or like big holes in what we were talking about, I think we should move to take home points. I, I just want to say this is a, a really fun episode already. I can tell. That's, that's I love it. it. I, I could listen to you guys all <laughs> night. This Mic is, drop. This is so, yeah, right. Where, where do you even follow It's almost over. You realize that, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think that this has been so fun and so awesome. And I really appreciate the opportunity to to think and learn with and from each of you. From what we talked about tonight, did you have any points that you wanted to really like hammer home? Like if the residents were only going to remember one or two things from this, is there one or two favorite points that you have that you want to leave them with? Yeah. So I think the few things I would say are one, we didn't, we, we hinted a lot around communication, but I don't know how much we specifically called it out. And that's one of the most important things that I think any successful resident can do is communicate effectively with their intern, with their attending, with the patients. And, you know, being approachable is, is huge. I, I love the quote. I think it's Colin Powell where he says, if your troops stop bringing you their problems, it means they think you don't care or you can't help. The last thing you want as a senior resident is your intern not bringing you their problems. That's a problem. And so creating that environment and making sure that you are actively communicated with, because the first time someone brings you a problem and you react in a way that would make that person not want to bring you a problem again, you've created a much bigger one. And so the answer is always, thank you. I'm so glad you brought that up. Whether you're, you know, fuming inside or not, I think that that's incredibly important um, and and I think the confidence piece, I think back to, I don't know if Napoleon really said this or not, but it's attributed to him of, you can't go into battle if you think you look silly on a horse. Uh, and so just, you know, thinking back to that new second year, embrace it. You're a senior now and you're not alone and you're going to be fine. Uh, and then I think the, the other point is just don't, don't lose the joy and to make sure you find meaning in the interactions and really deliberately enjoy the journey. Medicine is hard. Residency is hard. I think the transition to second year is probably even harder than going from medical student to intern uh, because all of a sudden you have such expectations of yourself and what you're supposed to be able to do and know. And it's terrifying and it's absolutely exhilarating. And just remember to, to care and connect 
and take care of yourself. And those things are going to help you take better care of the patients. And, you know, when, when you guys first invited me to do this and I reached out to my residents who all, who all love curbsiders and were like, oh my goodness, that's so incredible. And I said, help me guys, they're asking me these questions that you guys can answer better than I can. And they sent me back the most amazing and wonderful and helpful answers. So I have to give a huge shout out to my residents. But one of them said the best advice they ever got from their senior when they were becoming, um, when they were a terrifying new intern was don't worry about the efficiency or what you can do or what you can't do. Just take care of the patients. And if you care deeply, you're going to work even harder and the rest will come. And I, I thought that was brilliant in its simplicity. And so just don't lose the meaning and the caring and the connection as you're thinking about learning and efficiency and all of these other things. Remember why you went into medicine every day of it, because it really is a privilege and it's the best job out there. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Ah, that's the stuff. I feel like it's been months. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on iTunes or contact us as contact us at the curbsiders at gmail.com or reach out on facebook instagram and on twitter at the curbsiders we do not have myspace until next time i've been dr stuart kent brigham and i'm dr shreya trevetti and this has been dr matthew frank watto and uh thank you to hannah r abrams for helping to produce this episode uh hannah are you with us yeah, I'd like to thank Beth Garbs Garbatelli for running our Instagram and Chris Chu Manchu, who's on our Facebook. Were you going to thank yourself for running our Twitter? <laughs> and I'd like to thank myself for running our Twitter account. I'm Hannah R. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, did you say goodnight? This went exactly as well as I expected, by the way. And this has been Paul Nelson Williams, and goodbye. Good night. <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity. I would love any feedback now or later on if there are things on if you have next time tries for me. Um, <laughs> I've never done this before, so I am completely open and would be very excited to uh, learn from the experts. Yeah, read more, but no, I mean it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Absolutely. No, it was great to hear you teach today. again. Awesome, thank you. Hey, Paul, what was your teach story? Oh God, yeah, it's not one I want to show on the podcast necessarily, but you totally called me out for rolling my eyes, and I deserved it, by the way. But you, <laughs> so sorry, you, no, 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 it was it was completely warranted. But I, because you don't know me, but I, the people who do know me kind of well, you're like, let's do another round of icebreakers, and I couldn't, like, it was just reflexive, and I couldn't help it, and I didn't even mean to. But you're like, that guy over there just rolled his eyes, and I, I was humiliated, <laughs> oh, but also goodness. delighted that you noticed it and said it out loud. So thank you for. Oh, my goodness. Thanks for calling me on it.